in the other. Uh, I'm not going to do this tonight, but next week what I'd like to do is read something to you about the effects, um, the effects psychologically, emotionally, in regards to social media. Again, we'll probably have five people here next Wednesday. <laughs> Between all the verses you got to memorize and me talking about social media, I'm sure I'll make all kinds of friends. But um, that stuff's eating up our society. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, parents. Um, listen, I didn't say a kid, I didn't say you can't have it. That's your decision. But you better know what you're dealing with. And I don't think most people do. I don't think most people know what they're dealing with. I don't think most people understand how that stuff was designed. Um, so we'll look at that next week. All right. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's jump right into it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we've talked about three different judgments. Uh, we've talked about the judgment of God's, God's judgment on sin. And I'm going to ask you to take this message as seriously as possible, regardless of what I'm wearing tonight. <laughs> My wife goes, I'm not going to be serious. You got a butt humbug sweater on, you know. Uh, but uh, we talked about God's judgment on sin at Calvary. If you're saved tonight, you're saved because God poured his wrath out on Jesus Christ because Jesus bore your sin for you. Are you, are you glad for that? Yeah. And so if you're saved tonight, you've experienced, you, you understand that the judgment of sin at Calvary is really God's way of showing mercy to sinners. That's why you're here. And we talked about a second judgment, which has to do with you. Okay, now that you're saved, now that you have been to Calvary, and now that you've been there, okay, now that I, I've gone beyond this point, I know I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, I have God as my Father, what now? What happens when I sin? One of the first questions I've had asked me when people get saved, when I lead them to Christ, is, okay, but do I still sin? I'd like to wave a magic wand and go, nope, it's all good. You're fine. Uh, but you still have your flesh to deal with. And because of that, you have to learn to walk with the Lord. You have to learn to confess your sins on a daily basis. And we talked about the judgment of self. And uh, this third judgment is a place in time called the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, go there. And then we'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all right. And uh, look, if you would, down at verse, not going to read all of it again, but look at verse number 10. For we must all appear... Before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, we're not gonna, I'm not going to go over everything that we looked at last week, but let me just say this. What we've already discovered is that if you are at this judgment, you're saved. All right? And let me say it like this. If you are saved, the Bible says this in Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So just because you're saved and your sins have been judged at, by Jesus Christ being uh, the, the spotless Lamb of God that took your sin and took God's wrath and punishment on Himself, just because that's been done doesn't mean that we go scot-free and there's nothing for us to deal with God about. Now our sin has been taken care of, but our service for the Lord... Now let me say it like this. We sang, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. The old saying is, God did not save you, so you could sit on your blessed assurance. <laughs> Alright? The Lord saved you so that you could do something to reach someone else with the gospel, so you could do something to be a vessel for Jesus Christ, to be a vessel of His glory in this world. God didn't save you so you could just sit there and go, Yay, I'm saved! <laughs> All right, that's part of it. Thank God you are saved. But there's more to it than that. I, I was talking with uh, someone last night. And I said, you know, one of the most tragic things is watching someone get saved. And for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years of their life, they see a baby Christian. Now, listen, if you get saved, you know what you are. You are a baby in Christ. And it's, it's almost like a cute baby. It really is. That's a blessing. It's like, oh, look at that. You know, I've had, I've had people before. I remember one time, I think I shared this with you. I led a guy to the Lord one time, and he's swearing while he's praying. And, and I'm thinking, whoa, this is rough, you know. But he was sincere. He was sincere. And, and I've met guys that, you know, they got saved out of a rough background. And, and one time, one time, we're out here street preaching. This is great. And a brother named Edgar, he was a new Christian. I think he'd been saved for about a year. 
And uh, there's this guy mocking us. And he goes, Pastor, can I go, can I go do it? Uh, no, 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 no. He, he came from like a gangster background, you know. And back in his old life, it's like someone says something to my friend, I'm going to beat him up. So someone's yelling stuff at me while I'm street preaching. He goes, Pastor, can I do something? I said, no, 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 no. He said, you stay over here. You just pray, brother. You just pray. All right. Now, now my point is this. It's all right to be that way when you first get saved. But there should be growth in your life after that. You've got an entire society in America, uh, churches filled with babes. I mean, after 10, 15, 20 years, still babies in the Lord. I don't put all of that on the people. I put some of that on the preachers because they don't want to give people stuff that they don't think they can handle. Listen, listen, I, I've learned this. If it's in the Bible, you need to know about it. And what a lot of preachers do is they go, okay, if I say this, I'll offend this person, and then they'll leave, and they'll take their money with them, and their influence with them, and, and, and churches become a social club, and so therefore, no one's growing because the preachers aren't giving them something to grow on. All right? Now, now I, I'll give you that. However, there's something on your side that has to be done as a child of God. You have to apply what you're hearing at church. All right, it's like the old saying, it's like uh, you ought to come to church like Cinderella. If the shoe fits, wear it, amen? If, if there's something that God has given you, put it on and do something with it. God did not save you so that you can get up to glory and go, Lord, thank you for saving me. That was all it was about, right? It was all about me and you saving me. No, it was God saving you so you could bring some glory and honor to him. Guys, can you imagine your entire Christian life standing before the Lord and all of it just goes up in smoke, nothing to show for 20, 30, 40 years of God after he saved you, giving you a church, giving you a Bible, giving you a Christian family, all that he does, and with all that investment, nothing to show for it. What a waste. And, and listen, I, I'm not saying it's a waste in the sense of God shouldn't have saved you. I'm thankful that, that anyone gets saved. That's a blessing. But you're going to get there, and I, I promise you, you're not going to say, well, at least I'm saying, you're going to go, man, I wish I had. And I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to get you to understand. That's the perception you need to have right now. So when you get there, you're not broke. <laughs> you know, I, I think I used this analogy last week, but it's true. People in their 20s, you know, asking a 20-something-year-old guy to get health insurance, he doesn't care. He doesn't, he could care less. I thought, I honestly thought I would live forever as a 20-something. <laughs> when you're 20-something years old, you feel invincible. Right. And it's not until it's time you have a wife and then, you know, little kid, then you go, oh, insurance. This is good. <laughs> when you're younger, you're like, I don't even know if I need to buy car insurance. Oh, that's stupid, but that's how you think, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and then you get kids, you go, oh, I need health insurance. And then you realize, I'm not going to live forever. I should buy life insurance. And then you get, you get, and then eventually the gospel is presented to you. You go, I need eternal life insurance. Amen. Amen. And, and as life goes on, you go on. And by the time you're 40, you're going, oh, man, I won't be able to work forever. I should start saving. You should have started saving when you're like 15. But what happens is, as you get older, you realize Life is, I, I'm getting closer to this thing. It's becoming a reality. And as Christians get closer and closer to death, they look back and they go, man, I wish I'd done more. Man, I wish I'd lived for him. And, and what this, this thing is to remind us of is this, is that there is a payday someday. Now, if you're saved, this judgment is for you. This judgment is not to determine whether you're saved or whether you're lost. You took care of that when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. This judgment, and we looked at this last week, what it's for is to look at the things that you've done for the Lord and to see what motives you did them with. Uh, look back at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. All right, this judgment is for the believer, and, it, and, and you say, who is it for the believer? What's it for? To check your labors. Now look, I came, I don't, you guys left me out to hang, you guys, you guys left me hanging to dry. I, can't, I, said, I said, look, you wear ugly sweaters. I went the extra mile. Right. <laughs> Check your elf. <laughs> All right? So, you know, really what, what we're talking about is checking yourself. I don't just mean in the sense of daily confession of sin. That's one thing. But going a step further and checking your motives. Why are you doing what you're doing? You know, I, I've watched... 
I'm the head of this house and you better listen to me. You know, that's actually a true statement if you're a man. You're the head of the house. But you understand, once you start taking that approach, your motive's wrong. It becomes pride. You better listen to me. You better, listen, you better respect. Hey, listen, gentlemen, I'm going to tell you something right now. I believe in that. I, I'm not going to I believe that men, that men should be respected in their homes. I believe. But I, I'll tell you this. When you get to the place where that's the way you're going about it, your motive's not in the right place. Ladies, now I'm not going to pick on you too much. I'm going to try to be gentle with you. But you ladies understand this. There are times where you can manipulate your husband to get something you want. Don't look, oh, no, Pastor, I would never do that. I promise I would never. And, 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 and here's the thing. You know, you can get what you want. You ever got what you want, ladies, and then you go, oh, it's not really how I wanted that to go. You know, I've watched sometimes women, they'll, my husband's a, a louse, he's a jerk, he's a good for nothing, I just wish he'd get in church. He gets in church, and he's there all the time, and he's serving God, and then she's going, well, he doesn't have time for me anymore. <laughs> now listen, what I'm getting at is that sometimes you can ask for something, and if the motive isn't right, you lose out on the reward. Sometimes you can go about doing something, and if your motive isn't in the right place, you lose out on the reward. We're not talking about losing your salvation. I'm going to show this to you in a little bit again. We're talking about you losing out in the rewards that the Lord has for you at the judgment seat of Christ. And you may go, well, I'm not a preacher. I didn't go to Bible school. None of that stuff matters. That has nothing to do with this, guys. This is not for pastors. This is not for, you know, the, the people that know all the Bible. This is for every child of God. The Lord wants to give you certain rewards, and we're going to look at what they are, but you have to go about it the right way. The Bible talks about striving, but you've got to strive lawfully. This last Sunday night, you may care nothing about football, that's fine if you don't, but this last Sunday night, there was a certain particular play where a certain team from California and a certain quarterback is leading the ball, and he's doing this number, and he stretches it out, and that ball comes out of his hand literally a millisecond before that ball crosses the goal line. Now, for those of you that don't understand anything about football, the ball has to cross the goal line. They call that a touchdown. All right, right? And so when the ball crosses what they call the plane, the ball creates a score, right? But if the ball comes out of the hand and it floats across that line, it doesn't count. And literally it was like a millisecond. You say, is it that big of a deal? Well, it costs that team the game. You say, why? Because if you're going to strive, you've got to strive lawfully. Some Christians go, well, I'm just going to do it my own way. I'm just gonna... Listen, you don't... that's not how it works with God. That might work at your job if your company's dysfunctional. It might work in your home if your home is dysfunctional. But it doesn't work with the Lord. He's got a certain way things have to be done. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number uh, 13. Uh, well, go back. Uh, verse number 11. For the foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now in verse 10, Paul calls himself a wise master builder, and he's building on a foundation, and the foundation on which he's building is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only foundation you can have. When I talk to someone about spiritual things, the first thing I want to make sure is, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? You trying to fix your life before you get there isn't going to work. That foundation has to be settled. That has to be taken care of first. Okay, you're saved. Wonderful. Now, there's some building God wants to do in your life. And, and so what Paul's talking about, that look at verse 11, uh, uh, verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, those first three are things that cannot... Uh, just melt and dissipate. Those are things that cannot be destroyed, but rather gold, silver, and precious stones, when they go through a fire, they're refined. They come out more pure. Wood, hay, and stubble, when they go into fire, they just go up and smoke. They're gone. And so what he's likening this to is the work that you're doing for the Lord. Now again, some of you, when you hear me say that, you go, well, I'm not a pastor. You know, I, I'm not a deacon. I'm not a this. I'm not a... That's not the point. Paul is not writing pastors and deacons. Paul is writing Christians. <laughs> and he's trying to get them to understand, now that you're saved, God wants to do a work in your life, and you should be working with Him. And as you work with Him, the Lord wants to make sure that you're doing things for the right reason. Look at verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, there it is, of what sort 
It is. You say, what is that? That's checking the motive behind why you're doing what you're doing for the Lord. Listen, I'll put it to you like this. I've seen people that, quote unquote, do great things for God. I, let, me put my, let me just talk about my own profession for a second. There are pastors that are in the ministry because they honestly like the limelight. That's wrong. That's wrong. You know what God will do to check that? He'll put some people in your church. He'll just be a thorn in your side. And he'll, we'll see if you still love them. Yeah. You go, Pastor, you're not talking about me. Are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. But, but you understand what I'm saying is God wants to, he, it doesn't matter what you're doing. He wants to check your motive. He wants to look at why you're doing what you're doing. Kids, if you obey when mom and dad are around, you know what the problem is? As soon as mom and dad are around, mom and dad become your Holy Spirit. And as soon as they're not around anymore, all of a sudden it's, Katie, bar the door. Here we go, baby. Let's go have some fun. Now, you're going to pay for that bill eventually, and you're going to pay with interest. You're not going to like the payment. But a lot of kids do that. You say, why? Because they only obey so that mom and dad will get off their back. They don't have a walk with God. They don't have the, the ability to discern. The Holy Spirit of God wants me to go in this direction. Therefore, Lord, my motive is not just to please mom and dad and to make them happy and to back them off from me, but God, I want to put a smile on your face. That's what the motive needs to be. God, I love you, and I want to put a smile on your face. And that thing is not just for kids. That's for all of us. The point is this. Your motive has to be in the right place, and that's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. You get rewards... Not simply based on what you did, but why you did what you did. I'll never forget one time. I knew a, a friend of mine in the ministry, and uh, he was giving me, he's recounting a particular story about uh, someone that was in his church and sort of just, you know, uh, he really had a lot of good things to say about him. And one day he just, this guy snapped. What he found out was he didn't realize it. And I guess earlier on in the ministry, you don't always perceive these things. But this guy was there and he was involved. And, but the problem was his motives weren't in the right place. So when one person got a little bit more accolades for something that they were doing and this guy didn't, boy, this guy's gone and he's mad and he's upset and no one loves me. And, and let me tell you, you can't do stuff for the praise of man. That eventually is going to fade. I, I've watched certain Christians gravitate to certain circles where they feel like they are going to be the center of attention. Listen, if that's what you're going to do with your life, you're going to miss out on the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord doesn't desire that. He wants to give you reward. Isn't that something, guys? Let's stop and think about this for a moment. The Lord didn't just save you and rescue you from hell and give you direction and give you the Bible and give you the Holy Spirit inside of you and give you a church family and give you all that He gave you. Not only did He do all that, He also wants to, when you get up there, He wants to take a crown from off his throne, and he wants to come down and go, this is for you. That's good, man. That's good. But you've got to go about it the right way. Your motives have to be in the right place. You know what God will do sometimes? He'll check your motives. He'll see, can you handle authority the right way? Uh, you know, if your motive is to be the, 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 the chief boss, the, the head honcho, and I'm not listening to anybody, and I'm going to do it, my, God will check that thing. If your motive is to get praise and to get the praise of men, you know what God will do? He'll, he'll literally, you say, God wouldn't do this. Yes, he would. He'll allow someone else to get more praise than you. Say, why? So you can look at it and you can go, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. You say, why? Because God wants to get you to understand there's something in you that isn't always right about why you're doing what you're doing. And if you don't check that on a daily basis, you're going to miss out up there. It's not just what did I do, it's why I did it. Now, I want you to think of, uh, think of it with me this way. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. And last week we also talked about this. We talked about the fact that the way this judgment will be executed is with God's eyes, with the eyes of Christ. And I believe His eyes, being that they are as a flame of fire, are going to look at the, 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 the works that we did and whether we did them with the right motives or not. Uh, listen, let me tell you something. If you're involved in ministry here, you know it's going to save you some burnout? Keep your motive, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've watched Christians burn out trying to serve the Lord, and I think serving God's a good thing. But let, let me say this as well. You're in a church that doesn't get people saved to put them in the machine to make them work. That's not what's going on here. All right? I, I, I'd much rather we slow down on ministries and make sure everybody's getting fed and growing right in the walking with the Lord than just we've got to keep the machine moving. 
All right? Having said that, if you're going to be involved in ministry, you better learn very early on that your motive has to be Jesus Christ plus nothing, or you'll burn out. All right, look at Matthew chapter 25. Let me show you, earlier I mentioned this. I mentioned the fact that if you're saved, you can't lose your salvation, amen? amen. I mentioned that your rewards are going to be, uh, your, your, excuse me, your works are going to be judged, and based on why you did what you did, you'll get rewards or you'll lose them, all right? But you're not losing your salvation. Now let me compare two places in Scripture to show you the contrast, all right, of what I mean. Matthew 25, look at Matthew chapter 25, and uh, look, if you would, at verse number 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered to them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, let me help you out. We're not going to read all these verses. Let me just give you this. All right, the picture is this. The Lord has given some talents to some servants. He goes away, and he comes back to receive his kingdom. The first question is, which kingdom are we talking about? Kingdom of heaven, right? We learned this in Sunday school a couple months ago. If you're newer here, this may not make sense, but here's what you need to understand. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom that follows the end of the tribulation. Tribulation is the darkest period of time this world is ever going to see. Thank God we won't be here for it. We'll be taken out of here before that takes place. But you have to understand, you've got to rightly divide your Bible to understand that that is what this is talking about. This is not directed at the church. I point it out because of this. Look at the end of the story. Look at verse number uh, 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Basically, he gives unto one man, he gives five talents, another two, and another one. The guy with five, he takes what, what the Lord gives him, he invests it, and he gets five more. He has something, to, that's a return on investment. The guy has two, does the same thing, he's got two. The guy that gets one goes and buries it in the earth, doesn't do anything with it, and he squanders his opportunity to serve God. Now, from a practical standpoint, you can learn something from this. The, the lesson to be learned is, don't take what God has given you from up there, the gifts and abilities he's given you, and just squander them here in this earth and waste them. Do something with them. All right? However, the end of the story doctrinally does not apply to us. Look at what happens at the end of the story. Look at verse number 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Well, that makes sense. I guess if you're not going to use what God gives you, you might give it to somebody else. I'll never forget the illustration I heard at a, at a preacher's meeting where this guy is talking about Brother uh, Shanks, a pastor in California, talking about a guy in his church we went to. He said, hey, I really, want, I really believe God wants to start this Sunday school class. And this guy goes, uh, I don't know. I'm not so sure if I really want to do that. And, uh, or it was a Spanish ministry, I believe it was. Forgive me. Spanish ministry. He goes to this guy. He goes, I think you're the guy for the job. And the guy goes, oh, I don't know. Maybe let me pray about it. And the preacher goes, okay, but don't sit on it too long. If you're not willing to do it, we've got to find somebody because we've got this need. And so this guy sits on it, sits on it, sits on it. Guy comes in uh, into that church about a month or so later. He gets plugged in right away. He's saved. He's grounded in the Word of God. He wants to do something for the Lord. And he comes up to the pastor and goes, Pastor, I know you mentioned the Spanish ministry. When are you looking to get that off the ground? He goes, well, whenever I find someone that can do it. He goes, I can do it. Can I do it? Will you let me do it? You know, he's just sort of like a kid. Ah, me, me. And he goes, sir, brother. And that guy takes it, and that ministry flourishes. Meanwhile, this guy's over here, and he goes, the guy starts to pout. You say, why? Because he realizes he squandered the opportunity. Now, at the end of this story, the guy that squanders the opportunity goes to hell. That's where this is different than, than, than what you have in your salvation today. I know some of this might be flying 30,000 feet above some of your heads, and we'll get, eventually, just stick around. We'll, it'll make sense, I promise. All right? But, but look what happens here in verse 30. Cast ye the unprofitable servant in the outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I want you to compare that. We'll look at Luke chapter 19. Luke 19 is similar to this parable. However, however, at the end of the story, the guy that spiritually, we'll just call him a spiritual bum, he took what God gave him, and he squandered it, like some Christians are doing today, and I pray that's not you. Um, you know, at the end of this story, the guy that squanders it does not end up in hell. Look what happens. Look at Luke chapter 19, and look at verse number 24. And he said to them that stood by, take from him the pound, and give it to him that ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he hath ten pounds, for I say to you, that every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Now notice, that guy doesn't go to hell. But he loses his reward. That applies to you today. 
And that's the difference between the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 25, and the kingdom of God, which applies to us today in the church. But here's my whole point in pointing that out to you. What we're looking at tonight is not about you losing your salvation. The contrast, rather, is in Luke 19. And it's someone that has been given something by God. And God says, you know what? Because you didn't want to do something with it, I want to take the time. Well, think about this, guys. As Americans, the technology that we have, the Bibles that we have all over the place. And, and Adrian, I'm going to take your reward because... You know, you had a whole lot more time. No, God, I was busy. I was working. I was, you know, I was pastoring a church. I had a family. Yeah, but you still had more time than that beggar woman in India who was starving, but she trusted me as her Savior, and she was doing what she could. You had more ability. You had more vision when, than that little lame leper that sat there in Thailand, bow-legged and cross-legged, and she has to hold the magnifying glass in her mouth because her hands are gone because leprosy has eaten all her hands. That's a video I saw. It's a real thing. And she's flipping the pages with that, that magnifying glass in her teeth and she's going like that and she's taking the magnifying glass and tears are coming down her eyes because she's reading about the love of Jesus Christ and she had something that you didn't have Adrian you had the time and you had the ability and you had the physical abilities and you had the, the, the education she had none of that but look at what she did have son take from him that has something and give it to the other that doesn't boy I tell you what I think the Lord's going to do that you say why because he's just and he's not going to compare. Listen, let me say it like this. What the Lord's going to do is going to compare what he's given you against what you did and why you did it. That is the judgment seat of Christ. And that is what it's about, and that is what it's for. And it's not going to be compared to anybody else. It's going to be you standing before Jesus Christ. Now, here's a question. When does this judgment take place? All right, let me give you a couple of verses to look up. Look, if you would, at uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. When does this judgment take place? The two major things I want to talk about tonight are, you say, what was that? That was introduction. <laughs> two major things I want to talk about tonight are when that judgment takes place, as well as what, why this judgment should matter to you. What are the rewards you can get? Listen, listen. You know what God does? He appeals to man in a way that makes sense to man. So you know what he says? He says, I'm going to save you. I'm going to give you eternal life. You're never going to die. And you know, what he you know what he tells him? If you get saved today, you can be part of my bride, and you're invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You say, what have men appealed by? What do they like? Food. Amen? All right, we like food. So God says, I'll feed you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know what else he says? You know, if you're faithful and you do with, the, with uh, what I gave you, you do right with it and you do it with the right motive, I'm going to reward you. You should want to know what God has for you at that judgment. You should want to know. Listen, you know what's a shame to me? And I, I recently read this. Most Bible colleges today are teaching pastors how to be CEOs of corporations and they're teaching them how to build ministries and they're build, teaching them how to build a staff, but they're not teaching them the Bible. And so they get out of Bible school, and they come to church, and they go, okay, you people, you need to go out and go out to the buses, and go out and do this, and go out and do that. All right, we did that. What else is there? Well, next week, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. Rah, rah, rah. Okay, well, I, isn't there something else to my walk with the Lord? Yes, there is. There are some specific rewards that God wants to grant you, and the Lord wants to give you, and he wants to give that to you at that day. When does that take place? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, and look, if you would, at verse number 8. I mentioned this last week. I didn't have you look at all the references, but verse 8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. You say, what day is that? The judgment seat of Christ. And look at what it's connected with. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his what? It's the second coming. It's the rapture. And so the judgment seat of Christ is connected with that event called the rapture. You'll notice in the Bible, when it mentions that day, there's overlap between the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. So here's what happens. Let's say you're saved. You kick the bucket right now. Your body goes in the ground. Your soul goes up to heaven. All right? That's exactly how that goes. You say, why? Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we were in that chapter, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But the, the body stays here, and to be absent means your soul has left the body. And so your body goes in the ground, your soul goes up to him, and then the rapture happens at some point in the future. I pray it's soon. 
And so the Lord says, come up hither. You say, what happens? Well, the dead in Christ rise first. If you had kicked the bucket before the rapture, you know what's going to happen? Your body's going to come out of the ground, and the Lord's going to, I don't even quite understand this, sort of Star Trek type of stuff, but the body just sort of disappears. You get a new body, and it's united with your soul, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen and amen. All right, but when that happens, when there's that new body given and that soul is united with that new body and you get up there, there's going to be something that has to happen before we get to the fun part. You know what's fun? Graduation service. You know what happened for 12 years of your life? Some of you guys looking forward to high school graduation. <laughs> Just as like me, me. <laughs> yeah, mom's like, no, 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 me. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. Anyways, uh, I, I, I know what, what uh, the sister meant, but I, I had to laugh. You know, they go to school with real people. At home, those are the fake people. <laughs> uh, but uh, I said, I'm not going to forget that one for a while. Uh, but you know what happens? You go to school, and you work, and you labor, and you work, and you labor, and eventually, da, 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 you know? Or, hey, here's this big day. Ladies, now, now, gentlemen, don't, guys don't think this way. Guys don't dream about their wedding day. They really don't. I mean, if you do, gentlemen, then maybe you need to be on more testosterone or something. I don't, watch some more football or UFC or something. I don't know. But, but here, here's, here's what I'm saying. Um, ladies look forward to that day from the time they're little. I mean, my, my little one, she's seven, and she goes, I want to marry you, Daddy. You know? Uh, Ariana still says it, and my wife's like, that's just weird at this point. <laughs> but girls dream of it their whole life, and they plan it out, and they talk about what dress they're going to have, and, and what music's going to be playing when they walk down, and I want to get this kind of cake, and I want it to be this many levels, and, and I'm going to this person be part of my bridal party, and, and I want this to happen like this, and we're going to do this unity candle. And if I see another unity candle in a wedding, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> do something original, people. Blow bubbles together or something. I don't know. But, you know, we've already done the unity candles, all right? But, you know, they think about, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you say, there's all this preparation for this one day. And I'll never forget, I'm in Pensacola. I'm working. I'm saving money. I'm sitting on a flea-infested couch. And my wife calls me. And or she's my fiance at the time. And she's in Colorado getting ready for the wedding. And she's going through a list. And my wife's super organized. And I love her for that. She completes me. <laughs> I mean it in that respect, you know? I'm just, I'm all over the place, and she's got, got this list of things, and you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, and she goes, well, honey, let me tell you what we did today, we did this, and we did that, and I'm going, oh, <laughs> you know, but, but she's like that, she's real diligent, and so she's, we're talking on the phone, and this is back when, brace it, there were no cell phones, <laughs> all right, I know, this is crazy, you guys listen back there, okay? All right, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you had to buy these things at Walmart called calling cards. And they're like, what is that? Me no understand, all right? You, you, you had to buy, and you had to dial the 800 number, and you push this, push that, and then you can make the call to the person that you want to talk to. And when I was in Bible college, man, I, were, I burnt through those things. I was going through them like water, talking to her. And, and, uh, and, and, and so she's telling me about, you know, I've done this and that, and then she goes, so how's the, how's the search for the furniture going? I'm looking around the house in the dinky trailer. I'm going, well, I got a couch. Really? I'm like scratching myself because it's got fleas all over it, you know. Some Bible school student's like, here, you want a couch? It's free. Oh, yeah, I'll take it, you know. And, uh, man, she had all this preparation. I, wasn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, guys, I, I'll tell you what. Um, that does make me wonder if I should cut guys more slack who want to Court my daughters and all that kind of thing. Because I look back on it, and I didn't know everything I was doing. I really didn't. But, but that said, that said, she was preparing. You don't just get to the wedding day, well, okay, so who's going to stand where, and what are we going to do? And, you know, I mean, we just did a wedding this last summer with Jose and Dina. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you what's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to disciple people, get a marriage counseling, get them married. Then there's a baby on the way. They're going to name him Adrian. I mean... <laughs> It's a blessing. It really is. Right? <laughs> Dina's like, no. <laughs> but there was a wedding. You know, there was, not, there was not like, we didn't just show up that Saturday and go, okay, what do we do? There was some preparation to get there. 
And I want you to think about that. Paul talks about it, he calls it that day. You know, when you talk to a bride that's looking forward to a wedding, you say, what are you going to do on that day? There's no question about what that day means. Because that's the only day she cares about. Her. You know what that day is for the Christian? Going home to see the Lord and standing before Him in the judgment seat. Amen. Look, at, uh, look at one other place. Look at, uh, you're already in 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 1, chapter 1, and verse number 12. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. Don't be ashamed of Christ. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Philippians says it like this, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. I, I, I want you to remember the analogy of a bride looking forward to her wedding. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to cruise through this. And uh, I forgot to mention this before church. After church, we got some cookies out there. Uh, grab some Christmas cookies. Enjoy some fellowship. Uh, Revelation chapter 19. Look at, uh, look at verse number 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Look at the last phrase in that verse. And his wife hath made herself ready. How does she do that? I, I want to remind you guys that according to 2 Thessalonians chapter number uh, 2, when it talks about the day of the Lord and the Lord coming back, he says that day, that day, shall not come except there come a falling away first. The church is going to fall away. You say, what is that? The church right now is not in the best. I don't mean New Heights Baptist Church. I mean all those that are saved. It is not moving closer and closer to the Lord, but rather slipping further and further away. And if you're going to live for Jesus Christ, you cannot look at modern day Christianity and go, that's the standard. You've got to learn to go beyond that and go with the Bible. But, but the church is slipping further and further away. So when the Lord comes back, she's not in the best shape. But something happens up there, and she gets herself ready. What do you suppose that is? She, starts, she looks at herself, and she goes, Oh, man, that's how I look? I need to, need to clean up my act. I need to, I need to get my, my clothes are a little bit dirty. Let me clean Let me get some OxyClean on that. Amen? <laughs> let, let, me, let me make sure my makeup's right. I, can't even, I don't even know what to tell you what's going on here. I, <laughs> you know, something like this, all right? <laughs> Thank God. You don't want a pastor that knows how to put on makeup. <laughs> look, at, uh, look at verse number uh, 8. And her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Look at that. Clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a feast that follows whatever this event is where she gets herself ready. You know what happens after a wedding? There's a big reception. There's a big banquet. And everybody rejoices, but no one that's there rejoicing knows everything that it took for that bride to get to look the way that she did that day. And you know what happens is she gets herself ready, she gets herself cleaned up. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Let me show you something. Ephesians chapter number 5. You know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? He says uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, it says about Jesus Christ that he is spotless Lamb of God. Do you know what Jesus Christ wants in His church? He wants His church to be a reflection of Him. He wants His bride to reflect His nature. You say, what is that? Spotless. Clean. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And look what it talks about here. And there's some great instruction about husbands and wives. Verse number, uh, Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He's the Savior of the body. If you're going to pound the pulpit and say, on the head, on the head, on the head, you better be willing to lay down your life, gentlemen. And that means, and my wife will use it every time I preach on it. She goes, that night, tonight, I know what's going to happen. It'll be about 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. My head's about to hit the pillow. She goes, honey, can I have some water? <laughs> All right. Uh, you better be willing to do it. You say, why? Because if you're, if you're not willing to do that, you can't lay down your life. Look at verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be under their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he, Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. Look at verse 27. That he might present it, the church, the bride, to himself, a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You say, what happens? She goes through this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. And her works are judged. And she gets herself ready for the most glorious moment of her existence, which is marrying Jesus Christ and enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, what is that? that's the church, that's the body of Christ. But all of us make up that body. And we are all members of that body. Of that body. So you know what the Lord says? The Lord says, you know what? You've got to get yourself ready. You want to enjoy the reward? You want to enjoy the feast? Okay, but there's something to go through first. And this judgment does not determine your salvation. I've already mentioned that. This judgment, if you're there, you're saved. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've got to hurry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to try to wrap this up as quickly as possible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me give you why this judgment matters for you. We've talked about uh, who this judgment is for. It's for the believers. We've talked about what it is that's being judged. It's your works and the motives behind them. We talked about how it's being judged through the eyes of Jesus Christ. We've talked about when this takes place after the rapture. And now we're talking about why it matters to you. Uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 11. This is not written to lost people. It's written to save people. Are you saved tonight? Yeah. All right, this is for you. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's not writing to lost people. He's talking to save people about the terror of the Lord. Now, so you may not quite grasp that, but that's because if you haven't really read through your Bible and you don't see what happens every single time someone comes face to face with God, you know what they do? Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. You know what Job says? Job says, go away from me, Lord. I, I'm, I'm a wretch. <laughs> I'm undone. When people meet God, that's their reaction. And when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and there's no pastor, there's no wifey, there's no hubby, there's no kids, it's just you and God. And he looks at you and says, okay, here's what you did. You ever notice something? I've noticed this. I, I study psych, you know, psychology to the extent of dealing with people. I don't mean psychology aside from the Bible. I'm putting psychology over the Bible. But when you deal with sales, we were talking about this, Brother Leonard. When you deal with sales, you know what happens? You learn a lot about people. And when their eyes get shifty, something's going on there. I talk to people about the Lord sometimes. We start talking about hell. <laughs> Are you a sinner? Oh, yeah, we're all sinners. Oh, right here, right here. <laughs> you, say, you say, what is that? Well, that's just me. I'm just, a, I'm just a man. I'm a sinner. I'm nothing. Imagine God. Face to face, eye to eye. You say, why does the judgment matter for you? Well, if you want to avoid some terror at the judgment seat of Christ, it would be better for you to live the way that God would have you live and to do things the right way according to what is for His glory, and because you love Him, number one. Secondly, let me say, it's not only an opportunity to avoid terror, it's an opportunity to receive some great stuff. Look at verse number 10, the verse right prior to that. That every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good, uh, whether it be good or bad. Let me give you five crowns. And you may, you may, some of you may know these, some of you may have them memorized, and that's great. My question, if you have them memorized, are you going to get them? I heard people go, oh, I already know that. Great. Are you doing anything with it? You know, I can't. I'm sorry. I saw something, and I, it made me want to lose my mind. I saw this thing online, and uh, I wish I could remember exactly what the question was. But it was this far out, super deep Bible. And I just thought to myself, dude, honestly, it's not that we shouldn't ask deep Bible questions. There's a place for that. But I've been around certain people that that's all they do. I'm just thinking, you know, maybe you should just figure out how to wake up on time and read your Bible. Maybe you should just figure out how to keep a job. I'm serious. And, and so, look, here's, here's the thing. You may know this already, but it's good to hear it again. Five crowns. Number one, the crown of righteousness. We just read about it. That's a crown that the Lord gives to all those that love His appearing. When He comes back, are you going to be like this? Or, you know, I mean, you're going to go either way if you're saved, but boy, is the, you might want to go first class. You can get a crown of righteousness just for loving His appearing. There's the crown of life, James chapter 1, verse 12, for enduring temptation. Anybody here have any temptations? Amen. All right. Uh, there's a couple of you. All right. Um, <laughs> if you've got temptations, isn't it hard sometimes? Don't you feel like, oh, man, I just want to give in. I want that fifth slice of pizza. <laughs> you know, I know it's midnight, but I still want the Sunday. And, and, and you know, just giving in to the flesh, giving in to the flesh. 
And there's something that will help you. There's something about knowing that, man, if I just learn to say no to my flesh, when I get up to see him, he'll reward me for that. Crown of, tempta- uh, crown of life to avoid temptation. James chapter 1, verse 12. Thirdly, an incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. All right, you say, what is that? Well, go over there real quickly and look. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You know what that means? You're not this, and you're not this. You're not, you know, just, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do everything. I'm going to show up to every single thing. I'm going to do everything. And I'm gonna, hey, listen, let's start with getting up in the morning and reading your Bible, and that's... From there, let's work on, hey, can you pray for five minutes? And Yeah, I've heard people, I've heard people say this. At the turn of the year, I'm going to go on this super, super crazy diet. And I'm going to work out every day at the gym. And look, if, if you're in really good shape, you can pull that off. But if you haven't been on a diet in years and you haven't even walked, you shouldn't be running on a treadmill yet. I'm not trying to be, I'm just, right? This is the illustration. The idea is what most people do is they go, I'm going to do it. Oh, and then after two days, they're like, can't do it. And that, that New Year's resolution's out the window. What I'm saying is temperance will teach you, I'm going to pace myself. Because I'm not doing this to get ahead of somebody else. I'm doing this just so I can please the Lord. Okay, Lord, I've been able to handle that. You know what the Lord does with people in, in ministry? He doesn't put on someone that hasn't been faithful to come to church. He says, okay, I want you to be a pastor. I, I had someone recently reach out to me about something like this. and said, look, 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 you got this thing upside down and backwards. It doesn't work that way. God's not going to call you after you've been sitting around doing nothing. He's going to bring you here, and he's going to give you that experience and bring you here. We said, what is that? Just some temperance. The Lord, one of the fruits of the Spirit is temperance. And so he talks about being temperate in all things there in verse number 25. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beeth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it in a subjection. You say, what is that? By learning to tell the flesh, not specifically even temptation, but just by learning some things. Let me help you out. If you want to have a consistent walk with the Lord, staying up till midnight. Now, if you're working a job that has you doing I know some guys work some different shifts. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sitting there and just binging on Netflix. And then you go, well, I just don't have time to read my Bible. Now, some of this stuff isn't even spiritual. It's just character. You know? You say, what is that? Temperance. Temperance. You know what the Lord says? I'm going to give you an incorruptible crown if you learn some temperance. How about this? 1 Peter chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. We don't have time for it right now. But for those that feed the flock of God, a crown of glory. Those that, that shepherd others, those that feed them the word of God, there's a crown of glory. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll be wrapping it up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Um, and let me say this. It's an opportunity to receive rewards, and, and it's also an opportunity to be clothed. I don't have a time to go into all of what that's about. We'll probably talk about that some other time. But Second Thessalonians chapter 1, you're like, Pastor, being clothed is a good thing. Yes, yes it is. Uh, Second Thessalonians, or I'm sorry, did I say Second Thessalonians? I think it's uh, First Thessalonians chapter number 2. First Thessalonians chapter number 2. And look at verse number 19. You know, when you get used to reading your Bible so many times through, you know what happens after a while? You go, okay. I know the reference I wrote down, but that's the wrong side of the page, and it's in the wrong column, right? Um, so look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that has come. You know what he's saying? The people that you lead to Jesus Christ and that you minister to, they can become a crown that you receive at the ju- judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord says, you know what? You led this person to the Lord. Your motive was not for self. Your motive was you cared about their soul and you ministered to them. And boy, I'm going to give you this right here. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. And, and, and guys, those are five distinct crowns the Lord wants to give you that are mentioned in the New Testament. And uh, I, I, I won't go into that last part like I mentioned, uh, but there's an interesting thought, and it has to do with how you shine and how your glory shines in eternity, and we'll talk about that some other time. But my point to you, with you tonight is this, guys. I know we went long, uh, but you know what the judgment seat of Christ is? It's an opportunity for you to get something for the life that God's given you on this earth. You know what I want you to do, and my prayer is this, is that you learn 
to live for Jesus Christ. And let's all stand in the motives that you have. That your motive for serving the Lord would be looking forward to that day. Looking forward to the day when you look face to face in the eyes of Jesus Christ, your Savior, to receive the rewards, to receive the things done in your body. Uh, did you learn something tonight? Amen. Help you out. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Brother Mark, it's good to have you. How much more school you got, man?